I'm Michelle Murphy, and I'm here with my co-host, Dawn Watson. Hi, Michelle. And we are here with the Murphy, Watson, and Company program, and we welcome you, and we welcome our company today, Mr. Walker Vreeland, who I am a huge fan of. I, I just got to see his, his one-man reading of his play called From Ship to Shape, that's which right. was brilliant. And I went right up to him after the so-called curtain came down, and I said, would you please, please come on Dawn and my show? And here he is. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, oh, we're thrilled. Although I said before we came on air, mm -hmm. do not sit next to me. He looks too good. Oh. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. And you should see him on the stage. Most people hear him on the radio because he is a huge radio personality. Tell us a little bit about your radio program. Well, I've been doing my show for six years now. And uh, I'm on in the afternoon. I was on in the morning for my mm -hmm. first three years. Give your station a plug. What is the name of your station? WBAZ 102.5 FM. And... Uh, Afternoons are much more conducive for a life, for having a life. Mm -hmm. um, in the morning, working, doing a morning show is tough because you're up at 4 o'clock in the morning and then you're in bed at 7 p.m. And you mm -hmm. really, you're existing in your own private universe, it seems. Yes. Um, and so now that I'm on in the afternoons, I can, you know, I usually get, get to work at around 11 or 12 and prepare for the day, prepare for that day's show, and mm -hmm. then... Um, there till I go off the air, and, and it's, I, then I can go out and see people and be social. Yeah. yeah. So it's nice. And I would imagine, knowing you the little that I do, and I say this is the beginning of a long friendship because I immediately just felt such a simpatico um, meeting you I, the other night. I felt the same way. It was just, just um, this guy is very special, very, very special. And I don't think there are many people like you out there. Oh, thank you. So I want to know you better. Thank you. But, Me too, um, likewise. Thank you. <laughs> and I don't say that easily or readily, but there's what came across in your play was such a honesty, brilliance. Your, your portrayal was just so touching and sensitive and um, funny at times hilarious and yet everyone in the audience also didn't have a dry eye by the end of it it was it was just a tour de force I don't know where where was I and how did I miss this it was a guild hall right yeah yes mm -hmm. okay and so you did a reading so you wrote the play and then you did a reading mm -hmm. of the play one it, man show right yeah exactly and it's something that I've been working on for several years I would uh, think. and this was just the latest incarnation I've done mm -hmm. you know hundreds of rewrites, and, uh, and this was just another chance to get it up on its feet mm -hmm. uh, in front of people and to get some feedback, and, and, mm -hmm. and that's why your, your feedback mm -hmm. meant so much. Yeah. Um, but it, it really was a special night, and it, it, it felt great to do and to get the feedback mm -hmm. from so many people and there were a lot of strangers there, and that's always it, that always feels good when the audience doesn't owe you anything, but is willing to come along for the ride, the emotional ride. Mm -hmm. And uh, it convinced me that it's a story that needs to be told, and that people respond to uh, respond to this story, and that I need to take it to the next level. Why do you? And uh, yeah, make and it happen. You know, I was sitting, unbeknownst to me, across the aisle from your mother, and there was another woman, younger woman, next to her. And they were hanging on every word and beaming. And I thought, well, they're really into it the way I am. But I had never met you before, and I was just as hanging on every word and beaming uh -huh. <laughs> and crying along with them. And um, it was a full house. And it, it was an amazing evening. It was put on by the Naked Stage. Uh, that's Josh Pearl and exactly. Josh Exactly, and they're wonderful. I've done a lot yeah. of work with them over the years. Have you? I have. And um, it, it, for those of you who don't know what this mm -hmm. monologue is all about, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a story, it's a true story of my experience working as the, the lead singer on 
the Norwegian crown for Norwegian Cruise Lines in my mid-20s and how it led to a major nervous breakdown and, and, and how I sort of put the pieces back together. It was really a, a turning point in my life, a paradigm shift, a rite of passage. Yes, obviously, and, and uh, part of what I found is universal in your story was being put on the spot and asked to do something that you didn't feel at all prepared for and kind of tricked into. You were suddenly supposed to not only sing, which I imagine you felt very comfortable with, but you were supposed to suddenly dance. Exactly. And the way you described realizing, I cannot do that. Right. Well, I've never been a dancer. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I've always been a singer, mm -hmm. naturally, mm -hmm. and went to school for it and was a, was a trained singer and actor. And uh, I was hired as the lead singer on this, mm -hmm. on this ship. And I got on board, mm -hmm. and they expected me to also be a lead dancer. <laughs> and I am not. And Everyone's worst nightmare. Yeah. Uh, it's like the, the kind of things you actually dream. Like you're in on a Broadway stage and you don't know your lines and you don't know how to dance and you're supposed to dance. And that was what you went through. Yes. And mm -hmm. also, it, there was no structure to mm -hmm. the experience. I mean, I was expecting, I, having worked as a, as a professional actor, was expecting not equity union rules, but some kind of structure with a stage manager and a rehearsal schedule. Mm -hmm. And there was none of that. It's they very funny. basically handed me three shows, three sh scores to three mm -hmm. shows, and a videotape, mm -hmm. um, and expected me to just learn it and walk mm -hmm. into it and, mm -hmm. and do it. And I was not in great shape mentally and emotionally anyway when I took this job. And so it was a catalyst right. to, it was a catalyst to, to, for the inevitable. What, was, what would have happened anyway? Um, but it happens to be a great story because it's so, I think because it takes place on a cruise ship or it begins, the story begins on a cruise ship, there's something comic about that. Uh, being on a cruise and lately, I mean, in the news, oh, oh yeah. cruises, cruise ships are getting a bad rap. And so I think now it, 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 it just thinking back on it, being stranded, mm -hmm. really you feel, felt trapped on this boat, mm -hmm. uh, gives, it gives the story a little bit of levity, mm -hmm. much needed levity, because it mm -hmm. gets very intense. It starts fun and mm -hmm. light, mm -hmm. and I'm optimistic about the experience, and then it takes a, a turn, and it, it, it's, a, it's a piece that is very, uh, it, it goes to the depths of desperation and despair. And so that, that cruise ship so. is, is necessary one at the doesn't beginning. Really, one doesn't really think about having a nervous breakdown on a floating carnival. <laughs> right? Exactly. So that is, that's a funny setup from, from the beginning. Exactly. I know that what, from what you've said and what Michelle had told me, mm -hmm. obviously there's, a, there's some drama and, and there are tears and there's all sorts of stuff with this. But I think that is kind of a, mm -hmm. the perfect setup for, for mm -hmm. this story. So that's great. It's funny. There's that dichotomy. Mm -hmm. between and then you bring it to Brooklyn. And um, I love, and maybe you can do a moment, he does this impersonation of his psychiatrist or psychopharmacologist that is just hilarious. And every time he would just go into her accent. Can right. you do a second oh, of that? She was, um, <laughs> this was a psychiatrist I saw mm -hmm. for many years mm -hmm. in New York, mm -hmm. and she was Polish. Mm -hmm. And she was very... Very gentle, very present and intimate, there for you. And Walker, I really think that you need to be on the mood stabilizer. I think an mm -hmm. antidepressant has the potential to, mm, to send you mm, into a manic state. So that, that was, <laughs> that was, that's a little taste of... It, it is, it is so brilliant and <clears throat> very, very courageous because so many people, I'm sure, suffer from highs and lows and 
particularly out here in the Hamptons, people don't discuss their emotional life very often. Mm -hmm. It's more their real estate life. Right. <laughs> or uh, their party life. But it was so refreshing to be there and hear this brilliant performer. It would be one thing if he had just written it, but then to right, also to it. perform it and be such a, a um, gifted, gifted, talented actor and impersonator, you know, the way you did just that, adds a whole other dimension of, of um, brilliance to who you are and what you do and what you're capable of doing. And the, the thing that particularly got me was your honesty. And your, your, you help, you will help if this goes on to Broadway or something. Millions of people who are struggling with depression or bipolar or any kind of mood disorder and, you know, I, I know that Carrie, um, De Ke Debbie Reynolds' daughter. Carrie Fisher. Carrie Fisher, uh, yeah. I saw her do that on Broadway, her, yes. her play about her own issues. And it, it reminded me a little bit of that. Have you read her or I seen have. her? I I'm, have. I'm a yeah. big Carrie Fisher fan. Yeah. And I've read everything she's ever written, yes. and I've seen her one-woman show. Yeah. And she, is a, she was actually a, a huge inspiration for me writing this, not only right. recovering from this breakdown, but yes. writing this piece, mm -hmm. uh, her honesty, her willingness right. to just be a mess. Yeah. Just be herself, the mess that mm -hmm. she is, even mm -hmm. when, whether she's in the midst of a crisis or whether right. she's in the midst of putting herself back together. She yeah. just is a really, she has a, a talent for... Uh, allowing herself to be completely vulnerable mm -hmm. and allowing herself to just be where she is at that moment. In every interview I've heard with her, uh, she actually mm -hmm. comes into the second act, which you didn't mm -hmm. see the other night oh, at the reading. Right. But um, I do, there's a moment where I do Carrie Fisher on NPR with Terry Gross. <laughs> and I'm not sure if I can remember uh, the exact uh, dialogue, uh, uh, but she she's just so dark. And she mm -hmm. talks about it's like a black dog then, when mm -hmm. you just, you can't, you can't go on any further. And, uh, oh, now I can't remember what exactly she says, but. Uh, that's very Winston Churchill, the black dog. Yes, that's His exactly, that's depression. what it is. She says yes. it's what Winston Churchill called a black yes. dog. Um, and Abe Lincoln and, and so many people in history, but God forbid anybody alive. Right. And nobody alive has any of these issues, only people in history. Of course. And you and Carrie. Of that's course. it. <laughs> of course, of I mean, course, of course. That's it. That's yes. Everybody else is tra-la-la, looking good, feeling good, and... Yeah. Yet they'll come on and talk about their terrible former times mm -hmm. with drug addiction. But that's all over because I've been in rehab now and right. now I'm back. Right. You know, it's always, it, uh, it's always about the past and mm -hmm. nobody talks about just having emotional issues, which I imagine almost everybody would have who's living a full life in today's world. You know, that's a great <laughs> point. And I, I didn't... I. I never really thought about that. Mm. Out here, people don't talk about their mm. weaknesses, their struggles. And I, I realize it's somewhat of a generalization, but mm. it, it is true. There's a lot of the, the life out here, mm. at least on the surface. It, there is a superficiality to it, and I, I, I guess I'm, it makes me happy to, to know that I can bring it down to earth uh, for, mm -hmm. for an hour and a half. It, and you're bringing it from a highly successful, functioning person. And you give this great hope that, hey, you can go through this dark time and look at how I am living. And I'm here to tell the story. And there is hope. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to say also, when you drive by almost any of the churches, they are overflowing with people in their 12-step programs sure, <laughs> talking sure. about their dark times, mm -hmm. but it doesn't come out of those rooms. Well, very because often. it's anonymous. Yes. And or should be. And, and it should be. And 
and and that's 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 what it should be. It, yes. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, but I think just talking about it, mm -hmm. having the conversation is what's so important because mm -hmm. I I think it reminds people that they're not alone. Right. And that, like you said, there's hope. Yeah, big hope. And when people feel the darkness of their lives to realize um, they're not the only ones that have ever felt that way and they're going mm -hmm. to recover and however it happens, and it's not a, a shameful thing. Mm -hmm. it, it happens to people who are incredibly deep and thinking and feeling human beings. like Especially, yeah. Michelle, because I, I know that when you're in it, mm -hmm. when you're going through it, I mean, I know for myself, I didn't think that there was a way out. I just, mm -hmm. when, when you live a certain way for 25 years, mm -hmm. you just assume that that's the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. That's, that those are the cards you've been dealt. Mm -hmm. And that is the life you're going to live in. That's the way it will always be. Yes. And so when that turned out not to be the case, mm -hmm. and my life changed and I was able to, to heal yes. and live a fully functioning, happy, yes. healthy life. Uh, I was just as surprised as everyone else. And uh, I, I still, when I think about the fact that I got through what I got through, mm -hmm. uh, it's a miracle. Uh, yeah. it, it, it seems like a miracle yeah. because I didn't, I, at the time, just again, I thought mm -hmm. this is just the way it's always going to be. It's going to be the way this is going to be my life when I'm 25, 35, 45, 55. It's never going to change. I'm always going to be just tortured and in my head. Um, and uh, maybe I'm starting to think that it has something to do with aging, maturing. I know that the brain does mm -hmm. not fully mature until your mid to late 20s. It's so true. And I'm starting to think that maybe that has something to do with mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Do you think also that your choice of profession and certainly mm -hmm. your choice of, of location and circumstance has contributed to your um, road to healthiness? Absolutely. And I mm -hmm. think it, it, it goes hand in hand. My choice to leave my work as an actor mm -hmm. and go into radio and move out here. Mm -hmm. um, all of those, I think, were contributing factors that helped me, helped me a great deal uh, get on the road to recovery. Uh, absolutely. I think that life as an actor, I mean, everyone always says this, but life as an actor is tough. I mean, you're, you're just filled with rejection day after day after day after day. Mm -hmm. Now what you do, um, your, your primary job, your primary focus um, that we all know you for is, is being on the radio. So you're on the radio every mm -hmm. day. You have an mm -hmm. audience. You have people listening. Mm -hmm. You're talking to other people or talking about your life. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's probably so much more inclusive of the mm -hmm. world around you instead of exclusively oh, floating on a planet mm -hmm. doing something that where you feel rejected all day I'm guessing mm -hmm. don't you think absolutely mm -hmm. and, and being asked to dance on the spot sure I mean, sure right. huh. well it's you're also in control been, much more now yes, it's your show absolutely <laughs> and just to add on to, to yeah. what you've said Don I it's a wonderful uh, platform for me to be myself and be honest and mm -hmm. continue mm -hmm. the conversation mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of what it means to be a human being, I suppose. You uh, see, I think that's what sets you apart. Um, I think you're very unique and you have a huge opportunity that I was thrilled to see. I mean, I have heard of you as the radio personality. Of course, there are thousands of radio personalities out there, and they can be charming and this and that. But you bring something else that was such a wake-up call and such a surprise, and it's very, very rare. I mean, there are a lot of, like, Dr. Ruth's or mm -hmm. um, <laughs> all these people who are coming from a, a situation of looking down at how can I help you, but you're there saying, I'm here and I'm a real human being, almost like Jack Parr. 
And a lot of my material, I would say most of my material, is my own, is autobiographical. Yes. It's my own life. And, uh, and, and so that is, uh, it's a very uh, sort of surreal yeah. but wonderful way t to live. And it's very unique. And, and communicate and connect mm -hmm. with others. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you were talking earlier, and you made up, you brought up um, Carrie Fisher, who, mm -hmm. funnily yes. enough, is in the show. Now, I remember one of the first things I ever read that, that made me want to go out and write, funnily enough, is um, Surrender the Pink. Yes. yes. And then, of course, Postcards from the Edge, mm -hmm. and then, you know, so, but, you know, she writes almost as if she's writing a diary in, mm -hmm. in, in these mm -hmm. books. Why did you choose? Have you chosen other forms in the past um, to get to playwriting, or did you, how did you choose this vehicle with which to mm -hmm. tell your story? Because you could have written a novel, you mm -hmm. could have written something. Thank that God, was a it memoir. wasn't you just a novel. All of these different <laughs> yeah. things. So why did you? Because playwright mm -hmm. is kind of a, an out there way to, to go. Mm -hmm. I would think it's a gr it's a great question. Thanks. I'm still not sure uh, why it manifested the way it did uh, at the time. The, the monologue came out of diary entries. So a yeah. lot like yeah. uh, the, the form that in which Carrie Fisher writes her, her novels, uh, they, it, it came out of journal entries at the time I was living it. So I was writing as a, a means of survival. Are you still writing journal entries every day? Just no, I, no? I, and I said this after the monologue that, yeah. uh, you know, I hope that I don't have to go through something horrendous again mm. in order to, <laughs> to get write the something, to exactly, <laughs> to write something new. Uh, so I, I was, I was, again, I was writing it at the time and it became this one man show. Mm -hmm. And I think that came naturally to me because of my background as an actor, because that is in, it's a, instinct for me to telling stories is instinctual because yeah. Okay. I yeah because of my because of my I guess the way I identify as an actor still even mm -hmm. though I'm not an actor anymore professionally mm -hmm. I identify mm -hmm. sort of archetypally as an yes. actor yeah. or storyteller and I suppose that's why it came into being the way that it did do you know Andrew Solomon's work? Yes, the I Moon Day love Demon? Andrew oh, Solomon. And that was a, another inspiration while I was mm -hmm. writing this. And he, he um, won or almost won a Pulitzer Prize. Mm -hmm. Now his work has led to him being an authority on families who have children who have committed atrocious acts. Yes, or uh, families that have... Uh, children who are somehow marginalized in, in right. society. This is Andrew Solomon, The yeah. Noonday Demon, mm -hmm. and he has this other book that just came out. Yes, uh, as yes. Well. Um, he's wonderful. He's and amazing. Again, uh, and hopeful. brave. Brave. And hopeful. Yes, yes. And came forward with his own struggles. And he's gone on now to adopt tons of children. He just married mm -hmm. his lover and. Uh, and he's having a wonderful life now. And it's, it's recovery, but it's also the bravery of saying, I'm here to light the way, too. Yes, and yes. talk about feelings. Yes. Not yes. just my success and I'm all that. Right. Uh, which he I could have his done. his new book is called Far From the Tree. That's it. That's it. The I'm in the middle of it. And I'm always far. reading 100 things at the same time. Me so too. I put that <laughs> down for the moment. Um, but yes, there were so many, uh, you know, as you mentioned, Carrie Fisher was an inspiration. Andrew Solomon was an inspiration. Spalding Gray oh, has always Spalding been Gray. a huge inspiration. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, I said this as well yes. on the night of the monologue that when the east end of Long Island or the Hamptons or Suffolk County mm -hmm. knows that you have gone crazy, there's really very little left to lose. It's freeing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? You really yeah. do feel like uh, mm -hmm. it is, it, it is a, uh, it's, a, it's freeing. I don't know mm -hmm. how else to, to, mm -hmm. to explain it. Um, 
Do you really feel, uh, and I know we're going to run out of time, and this is a huge question, but do you feel that you went crazy or you just felt so much that that was the only way to react as a sane person? You know, yeah, to, uh, you're right. Because I, I, I be. don't see you as having, quote, gone crazy because going crazy might be like um, truly, you know, having this sad disease which has hit someone very close to me of paranoid schizophrenia, mm -hmm. which seems different. You just seemed like a highly creative, mm -hmm. intense, sensitive person who was hit with a great deal and feeling so much more than maybe other people who are a little more insulated mm -hmm. from their by their wiring. But well, I think you, that oh, sorry, yeah. I mean, but no. I think that everyone has those times, mm -hmm. and it depends mm -hmm. on how you. Treat that. Is this an experience where I'm going to learn and grow, or is there this an experience where I'm going to sink? Mm -hmm. And you've you've used this in some way, I think, to yeah. to better yourself and better the, the the lives of those around you. That's my not thought. to pathologize it, but mm -hmm. I I think that mm, medically speaking, mm -hmm. I had a if you asked mm -hmm. that my doctors at the yeah. time, they would tell you that I was having a manic depressive break, a bipolar break yeah um and they that that's what i was treated for right. uh, but you're right uh i am all of the things that you say are true i am a mm -hmm. creative person i am extremely sensitive mm -hmm. and uh i think that contributing factors were, were right. the medications that i was prescribed right. Right. that were just piling up one on top of oh. the other yeah. and you know Your chemistry in was that getting. exactly it's hard to tell where your true self is mm -hmm. when you're so medicated. And, and I think that's one of the questions that this monologue raises as well, mm -hmm. is that is that the right way to go about it? I don't mm -hmm. know, maybe it is, but maybe it isn't. That, that when you are having an episode mm -hmm. like, the, like I did, mm -hmm. they hospitalize you and they tranquilize you like a horse mm. to because it's an acute episode and they're trying to treat that and then once you leave and you're not inpatient anymore and you're out in the world then you can adjust to you know make your medications more conducive to living an actual life and being a functional adult but mm. i think that uh it's it's an interesting question that I, i'm not sure i know the answer to but it it, it is certainly Something I think to think about and talk about is, is it the, um, the ease at which uh, those in the medical profession, specifically psychiatrists, are mm -hmm. diagnosing mm -hmm. and prescribing medication. Uh, I know at the time I could have gotten whatever I wanted wow. because I was so used to um, medicating my feelings. Right. It was just, talk about instinct, that was an instinct at the time. Oh, I'm having anxiety, take a pill for it. Oh, I'm feeling depressed, take a pill for it. You're constantly measuring and reassessing uh, and, and well, oh, take away this and add a little bit of this, take away this, add a little bit of this. Okay, now how are you feeling? Mm -hmm. You're so, it's so mixed up and yeah. hard to tell what, where, again, where is my true self in and all if, of this? If, if I may just, and I know we're running out we're of out time. Of time. We're out of time, but yeah. I do want to um, end on the note that it seems that in our society, it's okay to say I'm having my afternoon cocktail because I've had such a hard day, mm -hmm. and in fact, I'll have two or three of them, and I'll smoke a few joints because I'm going through this or that. So people are self-medicating mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Your choice was to do it through a doctor. Exactly. But our society condones this, but one must keep secret mm -hmm. if you're doing something medically mm -hmm. um, until we find somebody like yes, you who comes forward. Yes, feel like, well, it was prescribed to me, <laughs> oh, so yes. Oh, yes. it's okay. Yeah. So, uh, it's Can not... we have you back? Because there's obviously so much more to talk <laughs> I'd about. I'd love to. I'd love to yeah. come back and oh, talk about my, my new do. interview series. Please do. I know. We didn't even yeah. get to that because there was so much to cover. Interviewwiththeartist.com. Nice. Oh, okay. Terrific. Thank Terrific. you. Good check it out.